Joining us here in Washington, Arkansas, Senator Tom Cotton, member of the Armed Services and Intelligence Committees and author of the brand new book, Only the Strong. Senator, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Thank you, Shannon. It's good to be back on with you. Okay, so let's talk domestic a little bit first. Some interworkings of the GOP. Uh, you had leadership elections this week. There was an open challenge to Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell by Florida Senator Rick Scott. Um, I understand the meeting was a little contentious, but this is what Senator McConnell said when he emerged. I'm not in any way offended by having an opponent or having a few uh, votes in opposition. Um, as everyone has said, uh, we had a good opportunity to discuss the various differences. Good opportunity to discuss differences. I do understand from a couple of folks who were in there, it was heated at times that there are fractures within the party. How do you move forward, reassess what happened in 22 as you got to already look at 24? Well, Shannon, I saw some of those stories as well about the tents or angry tone of the meetings. I got to say, whoever were the sources for those stories have a very low threshold for tension and anger. <laughs> I've well, I seen, talked to a couple of them and they said it was not kumbaya in there. Uh, I've, se I've seen much worse in, in my days in the Army. Um, I, I thought it was a very frank discussion. Uh, we had a disappointing election, obviously. We wanted to win the Senate in addition to winning the House. Um, but one thing we all agreed on is that we needed to have the elections this last week and then move forward united to make sure that we help elect Herschel Walker in this runoff because although we're all looking forward to the next Congress, we still have one more election on the books in the 2022 election. And it, there's a big difference between having a 50-50 Senate, as we've seen over the last year, and stopping some of the most extreme policies and nominations from Joe Biden and, and having a 51-49 Senate. So a lot of folks are already fast forwarding to 24, including former President Trump. He's in. Um, what do you make of his entry in? And by the way, back on Twitter, if he wants to go there, Elon says you're welcome back. You know, uh, Shannon, I opted out of being a candidate in 2024, so I don't plan to be a strategist or a pundit for 2024. Uh, the former president announced this week, I suspect more candidates will be announcing in the months ahead. But again, I, I want to keep our focus on the final chapter of the 2022 election and making sure that we do all we can to elect Herschel Walker next month in Georgia. Let's talk about China. The president just back from a meeting with President Xi. Uh, it's no secret that you've been a vocal critic of China. Uh, this is what the president had to say after their meeting. I do not think there's any imminent attempt on the part of China to invade Taiwan. And I uh, made it clear that our policy in Taiwan has not changed at all. What do you make of that? Are you as convinced of the, what the president is that there's not an immediate threat regarding Taiwan? No, I'm not, Shannon. Uh, I, I'm concerned that as early as next year, Xi Jinping could decide to go for the jugular. This has been a very important year for him in China. He just secured an unprecedented third five-year term. He's made it clear that uh, by the end of that five-year term in 2027, he wants to invade and annex Taiwan back to mainland China. Uh, I think he may see a window of opportunity to do so in, in the next couple years. In the same way that Vladimir Putin saw a window of opportunity to go for the jugular in Ukraine earlier this year, even if President Biden believed that an invasion is not imminent, I would suggest that it's not helpful to say that publicly because it might invite more adventurism from Xi Jinping. Yeah. What we should be doing instead, instead is working with Taiwan, making sure they're armed up to prevent any such invasion. You're also worried about TikTok. You told people if you got the app, delete it. If you can, just get a whole new phone. You're worried about the collection of data. Um, the FBI warning about that this week as well, Director Christopher Ray. But TikTok says this in a company statement, we store all TikTok U.S. user data in the United States with backup redundancy in Singapore. Our data centers are located entirely outside of China and none of our data is subject to Chinese law. Number one, is that a lie? Is that, are you calling them a liar? And if so, what can we do about it? Yeah, those are false statements, Shannon. There have been reports, lies, then. reports indicating that that data is accessible in mainland China, that TikTok, a Chinese company, is subject to communist China's laws and that TikTok is one of the most massive surveillance programs ever, especially on America's young people. That it's not just the content you upload to TikTok, but all the data on your phone and other apps, all your personal information, even facial imagery, even where your eyes are looking on your phone. That's why I've encouraged every American, if they're using TikTok, to delete it from their phone and if they can, to get a new phone altogether. So another foreign policy hotspot, uh, Saudi Arabia. This week, the Biden administration got involved in a federal lawsuit here in the states. 
they were asked to weigh in on whether or not they have a position on whether the crown prince has sovereign immunity. They did, through the State Department, say that there is sovereign immunity um, in this lawsuit regarding the death of U.S.-based journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Fred Ryan, publisher and CEO of The Washington Post, said this. President Biden is failing to uphold America's most cherished values. He's granting a license to kill to one of the world's most egregious human rights abusers. You know, President Biden had uh, talked about making them pariahs when he was campaigning, then July, the visit, the fist bump, all the things that have happened. Do you agree the president is betraying American values by weighing in to say sovereign immunity? Well, what the administration decided this week in granting sovereign immunity to Mohammed bin Salman is in keeping with the practice of custom of lawsuits involving foreign heads of state. It would have been a major break of those customs to not grant that kind of immunity. Um, what I would say is that Saudi Arabia is far from the world's worst abuser of human rights. You look at what's been happening in Iran for the last three months, for instance, and the way they've massacred protesters in the street or what China does to harvest organs or to commit genocide against religious and ethnic minorities. Um, look, if we didn't have allies and partners who don't always share our political systems or our cultural and social sensibilities, we wouldn't have many allies and partners. Saudi Arabia has been an important partner of the United States for 80 years. Presidents of both parties have worked with them. Unfortunately, President Obama and President Biden have taken steps to try to ostracize and alienate this important partner. What we should do is work with them to protect our interests and the interests of our allies in the Middle East. But how do we how do we rate these things? If you talk about China and Iran and other places. Saudi Arabia has got a lot of accusations regarding human rights abuses. This is, you know, a, a U.S. based journalist. I mean, somebody who was our intelligence agencies say murdered by the crown prince, at least knowing about or being okay with the operation. We can't just toss that aside. Shannon, the way I look at it is what matters most about governments around the world is less whether they're democratic or non-democratic and more whether they're pro-American or anti-American. And the simple fact is Saudi Arabia has been an American partner going back 80 years. That doesn't mean that we overlook or excuse um, countries that are pro-American and we can even help midwife or, or nurture them into democratic countries like Ronald Reagan succeeded in doing in South Korea and the Philippines. But to protect American interest, of course, we have to partner with countries that don't always share our political system and our cultural and social sensibilities. But the Biden administration didn't have to weigh in here. They chose to. They chose to take this step. That well, they, sounds no, a lot like overlooking what happened there. Well, you're right. They didn't have to weigh in. But again, it would have been a major breach with customary practice and international law to not weigh in. In every case going back decades, uh, cited in the State Department's own statement, heads of state have been given sovereign immunity. Now, in, in 1970s, we changed the law for suing foreign governments. That's why, for instance, American citizens have been able to sue governments that have sponsored terrorist attacks uh, and terrorist victims can get retribution. But when you're talking about individuals who are at the head of a foreign government, it's been customary for decades to grant them immunity. So it would be a major break and another effort in the campaign to alienate and ostracize Saudi Arabia not to recognize this traditional kind of immunity. All right, Senator Cotton, thank you for your time. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. Thank you, Shannon. Happy Thanksgiving.